the most punishing, exciting, and memorable moments in the sport of boxing. The controversial knockout. From Jack Johnson's intentional loss to Muhammad Ali's phantom punch, these are the questionable endings that are forever debated, but definitively never answered. You gotta remember that everybody looked at him with their eyes, they'll have their opinion, and you can't stop it, that's life. But man, it was controversial. With one punch, this mighty blow can terminate a fight at any given second. It is boxing's shortest period of violence that the likes of Gene Fulmer remember the longest. It's a sensation I've never had before, and uh, I don't necessarily want it again. The brutal knockout is the most ferocious, vicious, relentless battle of man versus man, as painful to watch as to endure for warriors Ike Williams and Bo Jack. I don't care if you hit me in my chin, hit me in my stomach, that's your business, but you're going to pee for it if I can. And symbolic of the most victorious conquest of all, the comeback knockout, when defeat is overcome through heart and determination, a lesson well learned by Billy Kahn. If you know how to fight and everything, you make them fight your fight, you beat them. And I was doing it until a wise guy, me, got fresh and tried to knock them out. These are just a few of the many triumphant moments in boxing's greatest knockouts. Knockout, more than just a shot in the head. It's a concept in the head and in our language. She's a knockout. It's a knockout. And more than just a word, the final word. Hi, I'm Larry Merchant, here to dwell for 15 rounds and not less on knockouts, on everything you ever wanted to know about knockouts. The knockout is basic and specific to boxing. It reveals the peril, it defines the drama. Boxing is the theater of the unexpected because one punch can change everything. When you watch a fight, unlike a ball game, there's a very real possibility that it could end, and end memorably, at any moment. With me to provide an historical and analytical view of memorable knockouts is the heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson. Mike, everyone knows you're a knockout fighter. Everyone doesn't know you're a student of the game, of its history. And that in itself is unusual. Not many athletes ever get involved as much. You've watched thousands of hours of films. How did this come about? Well, when I was 12 years old, I was saying I spent a great deal of time Customado, and at his house, there's a vast variety of fight history, and I made it my business to find out everything I can about these fighters, and I figured if I'm going to enter a game, I should know everything about it from the beginning to the end. What was it about knockout fighters particularly that excited you or inspired you? Well, to be the knockout fighter, it was something that everyone would love to see you. You drew more attention. You would use more, you made more money, and there's a great probability that when, you come, when people come to see you fight, there's going to be a knockout. So you could depend on always people coming to see you fight. Was there anyone in particular that excited you? Any one athlete, any obscure athletes, famous athletes who really got you excited? My, my favorite fighter when I first got interested in watching the legendary fighters was Henry Armstrong. To watch someone so small from 122 pounds move up to 147 pounds and win all three titles simultaneously and that means he has to jump from weight differentials from 47 to 35 to 22 it was just unbelievable well fortunately for real big men there are no weights you can jump up to <laughs> hey, tell me about it <laughs> did i say that knockout is the final word well usually but there have been controversial knockouts that were only the opening salvos. As early as 1900, controversy has surrounded boxing. In this second attempt to ever successfully film a fight in artificial light, featherweight champ Terry McGovern took on one of boxing's earliest and most dominating black fighters, Joe Gans. In the second round, Gann suspiciously went down a total of five times, later admitting that he had indeed thrown the fight to satisfy the betting whims of his manager, Al Herford. Boxing had suffered a terrible black eye, 
and the city of Chicago would not host another title bout for over a decade. There are few featherweight champs who have been as successful as Willie Pep. In 1954, when he fought the much lesser experienced Lulu Perez, Pep had only six defeats in 190 fights. In the second round, Pep hit the canvas not once, not twice, but three times, losing by the three knockdown rule. For Pep, this should have been a simple stepping stone towards regaining the title. Prior to the first bell, Pep received a warning from the Boxing Commission because of circulating rumors that he had not come to fight. Experts felt that Pep should have easily won. Nonetheless, this great featherweight was never allowed to fight in New York again. As a black champion in the early 1900s, Jack Johnson was a marked man who could hardly avoid controversy. Convicted of violating the Mann Act for transporting women across state lines for immoral purposes, Johnson jumped bail and fled to Europe. Two years later, he was granted a pardon and the opportunity of returning to the U.S. to visit his dying mother if he would agree to fight the latest white hope, Jess Willard. In over 100 degree heat, Johnson and Willard battled for 25 rounds. In the 26th round, the controversy unraveled as the first black heavyweight champion was counted out. Lying on the canvas, rumors spread that Johnson was shielding his eyes from the blazing sun. Eight years later, in an affidavit given to Ring Magazine, Johnson disclosed that he had thrown the fight, stating, I still say that I lost through pressure to a man who could not beat me. When Jack Sharkey and Max Schmeling fought for Gene Tunney's vacated crown, Sharkey was regarded as the world's best heavyweight. Winning the first three rounds, he was on his way to becoming the next champion. In the fourth round, Following a toe-to-toe -to -toe exchange, Sharkey threw a left hook that landed low. Seconds later, the round ended. Confusion followed, and Schmeling had to be carried back to his corner. The punch was declared a low blow, and Schmeling, still on his stool, was awarded the bout by a foul. It would be the first time the heavyweight crown had been won sitting down. In his prime, Roberto Duran was regarded as one of boxing's greatest knockout artists. In a 20-year career, the man with hands of stone amassed over 50 knockouts. But who will ever forget the welterweight championship rematch with Sugar Ray Leonard when this proud Panamanian faced the most frustrating and embarrassing moments of his career? In the eighth round, the macho Duran shockingly turned his back and spoke the now famous words, no mas, no mas. Leonard was awarded the crown by technical knockout and fight fans would question forever the motives of this great warrior. Controversy, dynamite. I love it because it creates interest. People want to see some more. So that's great for boxing. I love it. Sonny Liston was hitting guys with jabs and knocking his teeth out. He was uh, the, the biggest, the toughest, the meanest fighter out there. And he was fighting this little kid who had a gift of gab, who bounced around pretty good. And, you know, people didn't give him a shot. The little kid with the gift of gab was Cassius Clay. A 10 to 1 underdog when he fought Sonny Liston for the heavyweight crown. By the seventh round, a severe cut and injured shoulder prevented Liston from fighting on. I don't have a mark on the face. Yeah, and I upset Sonny Liston, and I just turned 22 years old. I must be the greatest. 
thus marked the beginning of one of boxing's greatest champions and controversies. The controversy created the other match. Uh, the something wasn't supposed to be. We had to find uh, a, a town that, that would, could uh, house it. And lo and behold, we found Lewiston, Maine. And what the heck, I'll tell you one thing, the lobsters were great there. Yet days before the rematch, the conditions were anything but ideal. Malcolm X had just been assassinated, and people were wondering now if, if Muhammad would be assassinated, because at the time, as I remember, he was known as Cassius X. And on Saturday before the fight, Liston had his last workout, and he looked awful. He was going to jump rope, and he couldn't jump rope. He got his feet tangled in the rope all the time. And we said, this guy's going to fight for the title? There was so much controversy going on at that second fight, I paid no attention to nothing. We had Walcott, you know, greatest guy alive, was the referee, solid citizen. So uh, everything was there. Not there was experience. This would be the first and last heavyweight title fight Walcott would referee. Well, first at the top of the belt, we went to the guy and showed the guy, hey, I'm the boss. But if you noticed, if you look at the film, he slid away from the guy. He didn't go straight at the guy. This is the thing you don't do. You don't meet force on force. You meet it with your talent, your ability, the ability to slide side to side, the ability to stick it in, don't take the other guy's punches. Muhammad kept picking, picking, and what happened, Liston kept following around the circle. Well, Liston followed him ring around the rosy. Now, during the time he was following ring around the rosy, Muhammad fainted left, went right, dropped the right hand over when the guy missed the jab, and the guy got hit with a punch he didn't see. They're the kinds that hurt. You know, those poor guys that went out and bought a hot dog, poor guys that were drinking on a beer or something, they didn't catch that punch. But believe me, the punch was there. There was great confusion in the ring. Uh, L Liston went down, he rolled over, Ali stood there and taunted him, wondering why he was suddenly down after that punch. Muhammad goes into the war dance bit. So naturally, Joe Walcott, the referee, is trying to get my guy to a neutral corner. So in the interim, he's missing that the count is going on. The knockdown type keeper's going one, two. Joe didn't pick up the count. Muhammad wouldn't get away from the situation. He started, bang, 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 started throwing those flurry of punches. Meanwhile, Mr. Walcott went to the timekeeper. The timekeeper told him, hey, it's all over. As soon as the fight was stopped, the fans started chanting, fix, fix, fix. Some people thought it was a solid punch. Some people didn't. You gather as many opinions as you could. And everybody seemed to have a little different version. If he did fix that fight or was paid to fall down, let's say, he took that secret with him to, the, to his grave because I saw him two years later in uh, Las Vegas. I asked him, you know, people still talk about the Lewiston fight and what is your version of it now, two years later? And this is what he said. He said, it wasn't that hard a punch, but it partially caught me off balance. And when I got knocked down, I got mixed up because the referee never gave me a count. I was listening for a count. That's the first thing you do. But I never heard a count because Clay never went to a neutral corner. And then people say I sat down. I was on my feet fighting when he stopped it. Look at the movies. You got to remember that everybody looked at him with their eyes. They'll have their opinion. And you can't stop that. That's life. But man, it was controversial. But Muhammad, look at all the other controversies created. We've had a ball with Muhammad Ali. Larry, I watched this film at least a hundred times. I seen the right hand land. I, it's unbelievable that the people were there. They couldn't see the right hand land. And I know I wasn't born then, but I have proof that you were there and tell me, did you see the right hand? <laughs> well, this is the proof. And I've always maintained it's the best fight photo ever. And not just because that open mouth fellow at ringside is me, but because it tells such an unusual story. Ali seems to be saying, get up and fight like a man. He senses that Liston has deprived him of his just due by losing so willingly. And the thing about the knockout, and I happened to see the punch. I was in a position, I didn't think it was powerful enough to knock a man like Sonny Liston I know, out. But, but tell me, were you the only person that seen the punch? Was there anyone that came to you and said, I seen the punch? Others saw the punch, or they saw what looked like a punch. 
but they couldn't tell that it had that kind of impact on a man to knock him down. And, list, and remember that Ali was not a knockout fighter as well. But there was such hysteria around there that actually people on the way into the arena were frisked for weapons. Women too? Even women. They opened women's handbags to see if they were carrying something in there. Remember, Ali was a revolutionary figure, of so much bombast to him. And as well, he had just admitted that he was a black Muslim. And at the time, the black Muslims were considered a violent, hostile, revolutionary kind of force. So for our generation, this was really like the Dempsey Tunney long count of old, the greatest controversy maybe in boxing history. And if you're wondering why that isn't in our show, why it got cut, it's because it wasn't officially a knockout, as our superimposed clock shows, because Dempsey didn't immediately go to a neutral corner after the knockdown. Tunney was down for 14 seconds, but he could have gotten up at the count of eight or nine. It wasn't a knockout. Most knockouts are neither as controversial nor as easy as the one that Ali had over Liston. Most of them show how brutal and often how brave fighters have to be. Two men, fueled by instinct, fighting for their very existence. In this arena, the human beast can exhibit a frightening brutality. In nature, only the strong survive. In the ring, where the subjective opinion of a referee can mean the difference between simple defeat and senseless destruction, winning is surviving. In this basic element, boxing is a brutal game. Intent on escaping the common labors of his Colorado home, Jack Dempsey toughened himself into a fighter but after a long and somewhat undistinguished career, was anxious for more stimulating competition. Soon the opportunity arrived as Dempsey's manager Jack Kearns slickly maneuvered a title bout against heavyweight champion Jess Willard. The 40,000 spectators watched a man possessed as Dempsey came out and repeatedly decked the lumbering giant whose only recent pugilistic performances had come as a featured attraction in Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. Though outweighed by nearly 60 pounds, Dempsey fought furiously, inspired perhaps by a reported $100,000 bet made by his manager that Willard would be knocked out in the first round. And so it appeared when the last of seven knockdowns seemed to finish the champion. As the crowd roared, a slightly confused Dempsey walked to his corner, unable to hear the bell that had actually saved his opponent. The fight was resumed until a broken jaw and a closed eye prevented Willard from answering the bell for the fourth round. Though he had won the title, Dempsey and friends had lost a considerable wager. The betting for this British and Empire heavyweight title favored champion Henry Cooper, who could deliver a powerful wallop with either hand. In meeting rival Joe Erskine, Cooper heaped combination after combination on the defenseless Welshman now past his prime. Cooper finished with a devastating series of lefts, sending the challenger through the ropes. That same left hand would two years later flatten another challenger, a brash young American to be known as Muhammad Ali. For Ali, it was his series against Joe Frazier that provided some of boxing's most memorable moments. Their first meeting was a tremendous 15-round battle. Ali again vulnerable to the left hand as Frazier took the decision. Ali won the second contest and later regained his heavyweight crown, setting up the now famous finale. Come on, girl, we in Manila. <laughs> And it lived up to its billing. Two great champions exchanging punishing blows for 14 brutal rounds. Frazier, face swollen, unable to see, could not continue. A painful victory belonged to Ali, who said it was the closest thing to death. Uh, Rocky, how do you feel about being a champion? Oh, I feel great about being a champion. And, uh, and I think I'll make a, a real worthy champion. I'd like to fight Tony Gazelle again and give him another chance to even up the score. You know, two fights and then the last one make it three, make sure. 
When it came to titles, Alexis Arguello wanted more to become the first boxer ever to hold four divisional crowns. And so he challenged Aaron Pryor for his junior welterweight championship. But this champion would not easily relinquish a title. He had defended six times. There's a right hand by Pryor and Arguello is hurt. The Nicaraguan challenger hit the mark, getting in one furious right hand. And Pryor is hurt. But it was too late, as Pryor cornered his opponent, unleashing a painful barrage of blows. Pryor going for the kill, trying to put him away, Arguello. For Arguello, the dream of another crown ended in a brutal fantasy. Thomas Hearns achieved the quest of winning four titles in 1987. But before that dream would come true, he had to face a terrifying vision. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. A torrid pace was set from the opening bell, both warriors launching tremendous assaults. In the third round, a cut on Hagler's forehead momentarily threatened his middleweight title. No, it's not Marvin, it's side. Let him go. Seconds later, Hagler exploded with a right hand, pushing Hearns deep into a semi-conscious nightmare. Thomas Hearns' hopes had been shattered by the stark reality of boxing. It is inherently a brutal sport. A fight is a brutal game. They, it is hard. It is rough. But when you talk about fight, Ike Williams, he will destroy you. He, he will destroy you. One thing he had, many boxers wish they could get, was a punch. And I'm the kind of man can tell you he got it. The former two-time champion was attempting to recapture a third lightweight title with his crude, relentless attack. Put that new one one style of fighting to come at you throwing everything. He started in the first round and he fought for 15 rounds that way to come at you. He didn't both both never do the final points of boxing. You know, was studied like that's Chicka Ray Ross or Joe Lewis. I was so punched at all times. And they were just wondering how could I get through with this all the time. From the first minute to the third one, I could fight every minute of the round because I put my body in shape to do it. I trained very hard. I was in very good condition for Paul Bo Jack. I like with Tyler. I love the Tyler. I guess next, next to my Next to my kids, I love the time more than anything else. Battling to keep his precious title, Ike was wary of Bojack's powerful weapon. The bolo punch was his favorite punch, I mean. He wanted to get to him with his left jabs and the throw the bolo punch, I mean. And the other punches were the left hook and the right cross. The bolo punch was his uh, his main punch, I mean. And actually, the bolo, both through the bolo punch, but he, uh, he looked too much. He made too much of a short. He thought he, he wanted the people to see it, I mean. Paul was very spectacular. He was this way. He'd come in and move it like this, throw the left jab, another left jab, combinate a right hand, another left jab, right hand, nothing, and I'd done the same. While trading continuous blows, a grazing uppercut broke Ike's tooth, calling for drastic action. And I was I was desperate. I mean, I had I had a perfect set of teeth and uh I started at one, I still have all of my teeth outside of one that he knocked out, you know. But uh, I, I did what anyone would do. I tried to finish both. I tried to knock him out. Champion Williams threw everything into the attack, unloading a furious flurry of hands and fists on his stalwart opponent. They were like this. <laughs> like this. They were split. So, you know, you can't get by. It took me too much time to do this and do this when these straight punches was coming all the time. When you get hit with a straight punch and everything is on it, you are a hurt man or knocked out. I thought the referee should have stopped the fight. And I turned around and I said, I said, Jesus Christ, you know what I mean? You know, like, what you want to do to kill the man? I'm a fighter. I'm not going to say no to any fighter. If you want to fight me, you fight me. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to run. You have to kill me right where you got me. I'm in there to fight. And I don't judge no fight on any fighter. I, I pick a man, I stick with him. And Ike Williams is a great champion, and another old piece of champion telling you he was great.
Wow, well, Mike, I want to <laughs> hug these guys. <laughs> hug them for what they were and what they are. Oh, man, you, you, money couldn't buy that because you're looking at two great warriors in there who stand for every means of great fighters, great character, great courage, great intelligence, enthusiasm, the fighting spirit. And Bojack, by all means, is one of my favorite fighters. And by the fact, it's Cus' best fighter because of the fact Cus seen him at the, the top of his career from the beginning to the end. And I can remember the story Cus always told me about. He was in Miami and he saw Bojack shiny shoes in a hotel and Bojack insisted I didn't get up on the chair and let him shine his shoes. And Cus, by no means, would ever let Bojack shine his shoes because he can't picture the greatest lightweight in his mind of all time shining my shoes. So he insists that Bojack get up there and he shine his shoes. Wow, what a nice tribute that was. What I notice about fighters like that is they're willing to take the risks for greatness because if you're going to knock another guy out, you got to get close enough for him to do it. And when you do that, you can also be knocked out. And another thing I notice is that there seems to be fewer brutal fights today, fewer fights of the Hagler, Hearns, and Prior Arguello type. Is that true from your views of all of those great fight films? Well, when you talk about brutal fights, you have to have two authentic tough men. Well, in which you look at Ike Williams, Kid Gavin, that area, everybody was authentically tough. They were tough men that came to fight and they believed in themselves and they had the confidence that no one in the world could hurt them, beat them, and so they were willing to take that chance. That's because they believed that. On the other side, we're objective and we're watching, and it's like, whoa, he's taking <laughs> chances with somebody that's very dangerous. Prize fighting is nothing if not dangerous and often brutal. But where human beings are concerned, you can be sure that the ridiculous is also not far behind. There's little room for fun in the boxing ring, with exceptions like this one, in which referee Dean Martin and challenger Jerry Lewis team up against heavyweight champ Rocky Marciano. It's all for fun, but occasionally the real fight game provides a few choice moments that can only be appreciated with a sense of humor. Twelve years into his official retirement, Jack Dempsey found himself back in the ring as referee when a disagreeable professional wrestler named Cowboy Luttrell took a swipe at Ref Dempsey. The former heavyweight champ numbed him with a shot to the chin. That incident set up this silly duel in which the 45-year-old Dempsey revived his once awesome boxing skills, battering his opponent around the ring, repeatedly knocking him to the canvas. But the stubborn cowboy refused to stay down. Dempsey's only recourse to knock him out of the ring, putting an end to the feud and the absurd contest. The role of referee seemed somewhat more demanding in the early 1900s when Mexican Joe Rivers challenged then lightweight champion Ad Walgast. The champ had defended his title in four bouts over two years, each time accompanied by Jack Walsh, a friend and Walgast's own personal referee. But in the ninth round, this somewhat sublime relationship turned ridiculous when after having pounded Rivers to the canvas, Walgast falls, nearly knocking himself out. Incredibly, it's his friend, Referee Walsh, who helps Walgast to his feet, securing another title defense. The referee in this bout provided surprisingly little interference when German middleweight Peter Mueller tried to recapture the title he had lost to rival Hans Stretz. In this rematch, Mueller threw such wild punches that a stray fist mistakenly flattened the referee. When ring officials climbed through the ropes to halt the contest, he tore into them as well. Ironically, Mueller lost on a technicality because his cornermen had entered the ring too soon. In another bizarre contest, challenger Stanley Ketchell, made to look heavier than his middleweight size, secured a deal to go a full 20 rounds with the great heavyweight Jack Johnson. Johnson scored solidly throughout the bout, but when Ketchell slipped in a few heavy body shots, Johnson decided to cut the deal short. After being decked by the challenger in the 12th, the champion arose with a smile and proceeded to launch a furious attack, 
shooting a right hand with such force, it left the middleweight a mouthful of broken shards. As Johnson casually brushed off a pair of teeth that had embedded in his glove. Said the champion afterward, he crossed me and I made him pay for it. After knocking each other silly for 10 rounds, these fighters were too exhausted to enjoy the hilarity of this moment. Each man makes and takes one last punch, lights out as they tumble arm in arm to the canvas. I guess that stuff is funny by boxing standards, but I don't think it was exactly choreographed by Charlie Chaplin or even Richard Pryor. The only thing funny that I've ever seen you involved in was your fight with Bone Crusher Smith. I thought it was hysterical that people paid $700 ringside to see that non-fight. Well, I agree with you 100 <laughs> percent, but I'm sure Bone Crusher Smith doesn't think that way. I'm sure he, he believed that wasn't funny at all. Bone Crusher Smith, a big guy. There are other big guys. They throw punches from way out in the bleachers. They land on people, and nothing seems to happen. What does it take for a real knockout puncher to get the job done? Well, there's a certain kind of knockout puncher. There's something, it, being a big man really doesn't matter. It has no significance in knocking out someone. The main point is the quickness in which you throw the punches and that, the leverage which you have in the shoulder snap. And, that's, and the object of really knocking out an individual is throwing a punch where he can't see. And when there's combination punches, and when you throw punches and you, and you keep his mind preoccupied with the body punches, and then the other two head punches that come to the head are the knockout punches. And then again, there's one punch knockout punches, which they throw one punch to the body, boom, boom, and then the other punch to the head, which again, the opponent's mind is so preoccupied on the one punch which rattles them just a little bit, and that's when the other punch comes in. Yeah, what I see in what you're saying is, is one, getting the shoulder in, a lot of fighters are, are arm punches, and secondly, the quickness so that the opponent doesn't see the punch and that that's what knocks him out. He's not prepared for it. Absolutely. Let's take a look then at some of the great one-punch knockouts of story and song in boxing history. It is the single punch that can suddenly and prematurely terminate any fight. Often described as a bomb, explosion, or bolt of lightning, the one-punch knockout is one of the most exciting and most remembered moments in the sport of boxing. At age 37, heavyweight challenger Joe Walcott faced his fifth and possibly last title shot when he fought the four to one favorite champion, Ezra Charles. In two previous meetings, Charles had won by decision, but for the never before champion, a perfect left hook made Joe Walcott the oldest fighter to ever win the heavyweight crown. 35 years later, Mike Tyson at age 20 became the youngest fighter to ever win the heavyweight crown. That was a right to the body and an uppercut to the head, and Burbick is down. With one punch, WBC champion Trevor Burbick was knocked down more times than he had ever been knocked out. It's over. That's all. And we have a new era in boxing. A rematch would not be necessary, but one that would be was between Ingemar Johansson and the heavyweight he had taken the title from 90 days earlier, Floyd Patterson. In their previous fight, Patterson suffered a total of seven knockdowns. The outcome of this rematch would be different. Standing more upright than usual, Patterson dropped the champion with a fifth round left hook. His left foot twitching, Johansson lay unconscious as Patterson became the first heavyweight to regain the title. At age 22, Wilfred Benitez attempted another boxing first to become the youngest fighter to win world titles in three divisions, 
a feat that had not been accomplished in over 40 years. With one punch, boxing's history was rewritten when Benitez landed a perfect thunderous right to the jaw of junior middleweight champ Maurice Hope. Five foot, seven inch, light heavyweight champ Dick Tiger needed more than hope when he took on six foot, three inch Bob Foster. To this day, it is the largest height differential in title fight history. In the fourth round, the legendary Tiger suffered the first knockout in his professional career. And for the next six years, Bob Foster would reign as the light heavyweight champion of the world. In his prime, this welterweight called the Cobra was considered to be boxing's best pound-for-pound -pound fighter. Now a former champ, Donald Curry had suffered only one defeat before meeting Mike McCallum for the junior middleweight crown. In round two, Curry was en route to his second title. But three rounds later, it was the Cobra who would be struck. It just goes to show that even Tigers and Cobras can fall victim to a single punch. In boxing, one minute you can be a champion, and in one second, this can all change with one punch. Robson was definitely a Scottish fighter, and I was definitely a crude type fighter. Well, the first fight I had with Robson, I beat him 15 rounds and never had a mark on me. That's the only fight I ever remember, never had a mark on me. After the decision, everyone accepted the fact that I had beat him and beat him soundly, but I was hoping that it wouldn't be the last fight. I was very anxious to give him a return match and prove that uh, what I'd done the first fight, I could do again the second fight. Robinson lost so infrequently, very seldom ever lost a fight that there was always a cry for a rematch when Robinson lost. Nobody believed it, and they said, let's see if you can do it again. Four months later, the rematch was scheduled, as the former champ would attempt to regain the middleweight title for the fourth time. The 37-year-old Robinson was advised not to fight the 25-year-old Fulmer once again. To that, he replied, nobody's ever beaten me twice. That I never really worried about this because I felt without a doubt that if I could beat him once, I could surely beat him twice. For the confident Fulmer, the rematch would be fought on May 1st, 1957. Well, everybody uh, was amazed at the odds, even though Fulmer had won the first fight because nobody was ever three to one over Ray Robinson. That was the only time in his whole career that he probably was an underdog. But the odds could have no effect on this fight's outcome. After beating him the first fight, I felt that maybe if I put even a little more pressure on him than I did the first time, then I could maybe knock him out because I was putting pressure on him and keeping him busy the whole time and making him worry about what I was going to do to him rather than what he was going to do to me. I think Robinson's best punch was anyone he hit you with. And he, he could hit you and hurt you with any punch he threw. The first four rounds, I was putting more pressure on him, and, and he seemed to be wielding, and everything seemed to be working according to the plan that we had scheduled, which probably gave me a little false security that I, everything was going right, and I was putting a little more pressure on him and maybe getting a little reckless in doing what I was doing. This recklessness had the manager in his corner quite concerned. He was swinging as hard as he could swing, but when he was swinging, he was coming out with his chin open. And I cautioned him every time. I'd say, Gene, it's okay to swing, but keep that one hand up if you're going to swing. Keep one hand anyway up. Don't have both hands down. The fifth round, 
The bell rang, they both come out to the center of the ring, start fighting. You could tell that Robinson figured that was his round. That's this the round he's gonna go at. He was definitely trying to get one shot in there. He was trying to set up Gene so he'd get one shot. About midway in the fifth round, I wasn't watching my hands quite as well as I was. I moved in with my right hand about six inches lower than what it should have been. And he slipped the left hook right over the top of it and caught me right on the chin. And then all at once, the lights went out. This was the first time I'd ever been knocked down or knocked dizzy in any form. I had no idea what it was supposed to feel like, and I can't tell you now what it felt like even. At the time of the punch, I was seated in the working press. And I remember all the newspaper men, as well as the whole arena, getting up and say, did you see that punch? That was perfect. And it was. It was the perfect punch. That's the painless way to go, because I never felt a thing. I didn't know what had happened at all until I stood up in the end of the round, and the, the Robson was over in the corner, jumping up and down. And I thought, that he's in marvelous condition for this late round. How come he's doing exercise between rounds? And my manager crawled in. I said, what happened? He said, they counted to 10. And I knew that it had to be on me because I hadn't heard any of it. <clears throat> and uh, it, it, was, it was a crazy feeling, but uh, it was over. Because Sugar Ray Robinson was a master boxer and could finish a fight with one punch and had great heart and courage as well, most experts have viewed him as the greatest of all fighters, pound for pound. Do you agree? Well, as being one of the greatest, I agree. But to be number one, I think that right only belongs to Muhammad Ali. That surprises me a little, Mike. First of all, because you're a slugger. It, it, it's sort of like Billy Crystal saying Arnold Schwarzenegger is the funniest guy he knows. Why Muhammad Ali? Because of reasons of he's 70 pounds heavier than Sugar Ray Robinson. Yeah. Much faster than Sugar Ray Robinson. Faster. And also a masterful boxer that has everything that goes along with being a great champion besides the punch, the courage, the character, and all around technical ring gentlemanship. And just from that point of view, you have to rank him among the greatest. And if he has you hurt, he will finish you. Have you ever thought of what it would be like for Mike Tyson to go against Muhammad Ali? I never, I never thought of the situation. Never once? Never. Even a little bit? Never. Because in my mind, I believe I'm the greatest fighter <laughs> in the world. <clears throat> and I can't, I can't relate to nothing unless it's reality. If there's something about, if it could ever happen, if I leave it around now, then I, I could relate more so. But as far as me dwelling to the past, how I would have done with Ali, then you have to take Ali when he's 20 and put me when I'm 20, and then we'll be even in the match, and then let us fight each other. Sounds like you think you might have come out okay. <laughs> of all the knockouts, one-punch knockouts, brutal knockouts, the comeback knockout is often the most dramatic. A triumphant climax to a lost cause. What a story. Or to paraphrase Yogi Berra, you're not out until they count you out. In the most dramatic knockouts, one man falls to the canvas. But not every knockdown is a knockout. In this contest, light heavyweight champion Archie Moore fought to stay on his feet, fending off a game challenge by Canadian fisherman Yvonne Durrell. Moore was being punished mercilessly, and following the second knockdown, seemed hardly able to survive the first round. The beating continued as Durrell connected again in the fifth. Moore was down but not out. As the challenger began to fade, Moore rose to the occasion, sending Durrell crashing to the canvas in the seventh, and again in the tenth round. Although saved by the bell, there was little doubt that Durrell would fall. The champion punctuated his triumphant comeback with a final blow. He later boasted, this was my finest out. One of boxing's leading authorities on the knockout punch was Rocky Marciano. With an incredible string of 37 knockout victories, he had earned the right to challenge Jersey Joe Walcott for the heavyweight title. 
In superb condition, Rocky was surprised when Wolcott, 10 years his senior, charged out in the opening round and caught Marciano with a perfectly timed left hook, putting the two to one favorite challenger down for the first time in his career. The bombs continued, every punch intended to end the bout. Rocky was having trouble seeing from a liniment that rubbed off Walcott's gloves as Jersey Joe pounded away. His vision clearing by the 13th. Marciano rebounded when Walcott loaded up a right hand. But Rock delivered first. A crushing right to the jaw crumpled the champion and wrote a new name in the heavyweight book. Rocky Marciano, the Brockton blockbuster. Jake LaMotta may have forgotten about the record book because Lorendo Teal took a decision in their first bout just a few months before LaMotta won the middleweight championship. In this rematch, Dotiel, a solid boxer puncher, jogged the champ's memory, sagging him against the ropes as his title waned. The Frenchman needed only to remain standing to become the next champion, but unwisely moved in for the kill as LaMotta opened up, unleashing amazing reserves. Then, a devastating left and a right flush to the jaw sent the challenger reeling. With just 13 seconds left, LaMotta had rallied back from certain defeat to retain his crown. In a rare modern attempt to unify the welterweight championships, Thomas Hearns met Ray Leonard in a seesaw battle, exchanging roles of aggression and retreat. In the early rounds, Leonard danced away from the hitman's long jab, but standing toe-to-toe, -to -toe, Thomas fired at will. In the sixth, it was Leonard on the offensive, wounding his quarry, then swiftly taking advantage. This time, it was Hearns backpedaling as Leonard set the pace, capturing the next two rounds. But Hearns regained his earlier aggressive posture, focusing his attack on Leonard's swollen left eye. You're blowing it now, son. You're blowing it. You got taken away from it. Leonard's okay. trainer, Angelo Dundee, knew the score. Ray knew the mission. In the 13th round, he exploded in a fusillade of fists, determined to knock Hearns out. Then, one more round, one last combination, and Ray Leonard had come back from a losing battle to win the war. It's over, and Ray Leonard is the undisputed For Hearns, a fall just short of an undisputed welterweight championship as his prize. The heavyweight championship of the world is the biggest prize in sports. And uh, more people have challenged for it, and more have tried and failed, but at least they did try. And Billy Kahn felt the same way. Not only that, he was a brash young Irishman out of Pittsburgh. He was a tough, cocky little guy. He thought he could beat Lewis. And the way he fought, maybe he could have. Lewis in the ring, contrary to what uh, most people thought, uh, was a very heady boxer. Uh, he was a good thinker in there, especially for the heavyweights who weren't known for the, their thinking ability he was formidable because he he made very few mistakes and if you made a mistake against him you got hit with one of those terrific counter shots khan was a light heavyweight champion gave up his title before the lewis fight and he still was a light heavyweight when he fought joe lewis joe lewis weighed about 200 pounds khan only weighed about 168 pounds the idea about fighting is don't let the guy hit you. If they can't hit you, they can't hurt you. You have to keep your hands up and punch real straight. No roundhousers, because if you go straight to it, you're going to get there first. Uh, I think it was a kind of a crowd that, while they respected the great Joe Lewis, they were rooting for the underdog, the young kid from Pittsburgh. Khan was using his speed. He was in and out. One good thing in Khan's favor was that Lewis had never fought anybody with the speed of Khan. He kept uh, moving to the left, and he kept moving to the right, and kept that sharp left hand uh, uh, continually keeping Lewis off balance and breaking up Lewis's attack. The main thing is don't let him hit you. Keep your hands up and move from side to side and mix him up. If you keep backing up, he's going to follow you. All you have to do is keep the left in his face and keep your hands up and keep your ass off the floor. 
Now we come to the 12th round, and this too was a great round for Billy Kahn. He was all over Lewis, and Lewis was having a time blocking the punches, and Kahn was fearless. Billy Kahn staggered Lewis. If Kahn had been able to win one of the next three rounds, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, he would have been the heavyweight champion of the world. Blackburn was the, was the voice in the corner for Lewis. And when he came back to the corner after Khan's rally in the 12th round, Blackburn told him, you better go out and get him, Chappie. We're going to lose the title. I went out to try to knock him out. And naturally, your hands are done and this and that, and you get hit. I lost all sense of thinking about not getting hit. I was worrying about hitting him and not worrying about safety first for me, see. And Lewis hooks the left hand of the jaw. Khan is being driven around the ring by Lewis. He is badly hurt, but he won't go down. Khan is staggering. Lewis hooks the left to the jaw, a right hand to the jaw, another left to the jaw by Lewis, a crushing right to the jaw, and Khan slowly goes to the canvas. The referee, Eddie Joseph, comes over. The count is reached four. I was in a great fight with Joe Lewis. It was great until the 13th round. I run into trouble there. So I'll have to forget about it now. Well, it was a great fight tonight. I know that Uncle Mike's going to give me another chance, and I know I can win it. I guess I had too much to win for tonight, and I tried to knock him out. Otherwise, I don't want anything. Comebacks, just like in the movies. Mike, all the great fighters had sensational comeback victories that they're remembered for. Do you envision that happening to you someday? Of course, because coming back from the brink of destruction always shows greatness. And I, I believe I'm a great fighter, and I look forward to being put in that category one day as I prove my longevity. And as far as great fighters like Lewis, Billy Kahn, and Willie Pep all come back from the brink of destruction, I believe all great fighters, mostly in the twilight of their career, find themselves in a disastrous situation and when they call for all their resources and pull themselves together and come back victorious. And that's the marking of a great fighter. What was your favorite knockout of all time? My favorite knockout, I have to recall, is Jersey Joe Walcott when he was knocked out by Joe Lewis in the 11th round. My reason, because a year previous, they fought, and Walcott gave him a beat, and outboxed him, outsmarted him. And at the end of the fight, they gave the decision to Joe Lewis, which a lot of people felt was being justified but wrongly. So they fought again, and this the same thing was about to happen. Lewis on the verge of being stopped and came back, put everything together from the Lewis of 1939, and rallied back to stop Walcott. Well, my favorite knockout may surprise you because I like to give some credit to contemporary fighters. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> I know you do. Even I you. Disagree with. <laughs> but I want to give credit to someone who had a knockout that was emotionally very appealing and satisfying to me, and that was a, not a knockout fighter. It was Larry Holmes when he beat Jerry Cooney. Holmes had been a terrific pro. He had been a dominant champion. And Jerry Cooney really hadn't earned his way there. He had sort of been hyped there and maneuvered there, even though he was a talented young fighter at the time. And when Holmes stopped him, to me, it was a vindication that the professional came through and beat the guy who hadn't really proved himself as a professional yet. Who was your favorite knockout fighter? Once again, I must say, Joe Lewis. The reason is because accurate, counter-punching, precise precision, there was no one like him. He hit you the right places placed every one of his punches. He even did funny things sometimes when he hit you. You did 360s, you bounced off the can canvas at least a foot. You're going out the ring, you just don't move. You quiver, and it was just something amazing to see. Of course I loved Joe Lewis, and Sugar Ray Robinson was a hero of mine when I was a kid with those dramatic wins. But I want to give credit again to some contemporary fighters. Yes, I know you do. W Wilfredo Gomez, <laughs> great bantamweight, Roberto Duran as a lightweight and a welterweight, Marvin Hagler, Tommy Hearns, knock guys out from the welterweight division all the way up to the light heavyweight division. And someday, you too 
as a heavyweight may be in the footage side of this show and not just sitting there in the chair. Well, believe me, I'll be looking forward to that day. <laughs> so this show now has gone the distance, but we do hope it's been a knockout for you. On behalf of Mike Tyson and HBO Sports, I'm Larry Merchant. Uh, I had a grandmother that lived a very long life, 112 years. That's a long time. And she said, I come home one day and I was crying. And she asked me what I was crying for. And I told her, I said, the boy is taking my money. I was trying to shoot at the time. Uh, and she said, you mean to tell me you're crying? I cried, yes. She told me to pull my clothes off. I went there, she gave me the worst whooping of my life. Told me no walker, run from no one. And if you ever run again, they're going to have to, police going to have to come get me because I'm going to murder you. And you stand there and you fight until the blood runs into your shoe, don't you run. And from that time on, that's what I've done. We left the ring, and the next thing I know, I'm come to, I'm standing in my dressing room. And I told the manager, how'd I get here? He said, what do you mean, how'd you get here? You walked here. I had no recollection at all of leaving the ring after I left the ring of how I got to the dressing room. I, it was like I had went out again, except I walked and everything else, but I had knew nothing of that period in my life. She was, I got a tough break, I could him When the title kept for about six months, I went around the corner, told all the guys I'm the heavyweight champion, and let you win it back in six months. He looked at me, he says, you had it for 12 rounds, you couldn't keep it. How the hell are you gonna keep it for six months? 